It's the summer of 1988, and you're basking in those precious days off before having to go back to school. You, a big-time hockey fan, have to make do with the fact you just can't watch your favorite sport for the summer months. But you anticipate the new season that's just around the corner. But it's been all right. Your favorite team and player just won the Stanley Cup a few months ago. So all is right in the world. You're at home wondering what you'll get up to today when the phone rings. It's your best friend. Turn on the TV, they say. What channel, you ask? Any of them, they reply. I'm Jamie Logie, and this is Everything 80s, a podcast that looks back on a decade that forever changed the way we dressed, consumed, and connected. And today, we look back on the shocking trade of Wayne Gretzky from the Edmonton Oilers to the Los Angeles Kings that not only rocked Canada and the National Hockey League, but the entire sports world. This is the story of the trade of the century. Question, who is the greatest baseball player of all time? That's a tough one. There are so many legendary players at multiple positions. Is it Mickey Mantle, Joe DiMaggio, Babe Ruth? But what about Lou Gehrig and Willie Mays? Pete Rose has the most hits of all time, but Hank Aaron had over 3,700 hits and was the all-time home runs leader for years until Barry Bonds. What about the best NFL player ever? That gets even more difficult because of how specific each position is. At quarterback, it has to be Tom Brady. But what about Peyton Manning, Joe Montana, or Johnny Unitas? Jerry Rice is one of the best receivers ever. But then Emmitt Smith was one of the best running backs with 175 touchdowns. And then there's defense. And you have to factor in players like Dick Butkus, Lawrence Taylor. But we can't forget about Jim Brown or Walter Payton. Okay, this is pretty tough. How about an individual sport like tennis? Is the greatest player ever Roger Federer or Serena Williams? But there's Novak Djokovic, Nadal, Steffi Graf, Rod Laver, Martina Navratilova, and Pete Sampras. How about in the world of football or soccer? The answer always seemed to be Pele, but is he the best? How has Messi changed the conversation? And then there's Cristiano Ronaldo or Diego Maradona. But Mia Hamm has done as much for the sport as any player. Internationally, the great Canadian Christine Sinclair is the all-time international goal-scoring leader with an incredible 190 goals. That's nearly 70 more goals than second place Cristiano Ronaldo. So, okay, how about the NBA? It seems like Michael Jordan would be the best basketball player ever. But is he? He may be the most entertaining, but Bill Russell won the most championships. And LeBron is now the all-time scoring leader. But what about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Kobe, Wilt Chamberlain, Magic Johnson, or Larry Bird? The point of all of this is, when we look at the world of sports, there is always the debate over who is the best player in each sport. But when it comes to professional hockey, there is no debate. Wayne Gretzky is the greatest player professional hockey has ever seen, and everyone is a distant second. Based on awards, championships, individual records, and how he reshaped the game, Wayne Gretzky is in a league all by himself. To set the stage for this story, I need to share how dominant Gretzky really was throughout his entire playing career, especially in the 1980s. Born in Brantford, Ontario, Wayne Gretzky grew up playing hockey pretty much as soon as he could walk. His father and Canada's hockey dad, Walter Gretzky, made a backyard rink where a young Wayne continued his passion. I had an English teacher in high school that were friends of some friends of the Gretzky family and would tell us all about being at their house when Wayne was only about three years old. The young Wayne ran around the living room with a little plastic hockey stick and you had to be careful not to get your shins whacked. That's just one of a few personal connections that will be sprinkled throughout this episode. As soon as he started playing organized hockey, it didn't take long for Gretzky to dominate at every level. He would score hundreds of goals a year, often playing with kids several years older. 
At 14, he left home to play Junior B hockey, where he competed against players as old as 20. In his biography, Gretzky explains how he did his best to avoid being body checked by people with mortgages. Gretzky continued to dominate, but the often used phrase kept coming up, he won't succeed at the next level, but Gretzky did. At 16, he was drafted into the Ontario Hockey League by the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds. In the 1977-78 season, Gretzky scored 70 goals and 112 assists for a remarkable 182 points in just 64 games. When he was just 17, he was recruited by Nelson Scalbania to play in the then World Hockey Association. Back then, players under 20 weren't allowed to sign with the NHL, so Gretzky signed with the Indianapolis Racers of the WHA. Gretzky was soon moved to the Edmonton Oilers, where he scored over 100 points in 72 games. But by the 1979 season, the WHA folded, and the Edmonton Oilers, Winnipeg Jets, Quebec Nordiques, and Hartford Whalers joined the National Hockey League. Gretzky was going to the big time. And the same criticisms kept dogging him. He was okay at the WHA level, but now in the NHL, he wouldn't be able to continue his dominance. It was always the same criticism. He was too small, too slow, and not strong enough. He had an average shot, wasn't strong on the puck, and could easily be knocked over. But what Gretzky did have was an extraordinary hockey sense, almost a sixth sense, if you will. He knew what people were going to do before they did it. Whereas many players skated to where the puck was, he skated to where it was going to end up. This was something that was ingrained in him since he was a little kid. He just saw the game differently than everyone. He played two, three, and even four plays ahead like it was a game of chess. He didn't need to be bigger and faster than anyone because he could outthink everyone on the ice. Oftentimes, it looked like he was completely out of the play, but would end up with the puck. The game just seemed to come to him. In his first season in the NHL, the 1979-1980 season, he had 137 points, including 51 goals. This tied him for first overall in scoring, and he won the Hart Trophy as the league's most valuable player. In the 1980-81 season, he scored a then-record 164 points. He had broken the record for most assists and most points in one season. Again, he won the most valuable player for the league. This was only his second year in the NHL. In the 1981-82 season, things went nuts. Gretzky scored a mind-boggling 212 points, including an unfathomable 92 goals in one season. Today, it's a big deal for players in the NHL to score 50 goals, with 60 being an extremely rare feat now. Numbers that Gretzky put up in the 81-82 season seem like they shouldn't exist. That year, he also broke a record that many thought couldn't be broken, that being the legendary 50 goals in 50 games set by the iconic Maurice the Rocket Richard. It's a record that had stood for 35 years, and Gretzky scored 50 goals in just 39 games. He was dismantling records at every corner, so much for being too small and too slow. Gretzky and the Oilers won their first Stanley Cup in the 1983-84 season, winning it three more times in the 80s. We could spend all day discussing his stats and achievements, but here's a quick look at just how dominant Wayne Gretzky was in the world of professional hockey and just some of his records over his career. He won the Hart Trophy, the league MVP, an amazing nine times. He won the league scoring title 10 times. He won four Stanley Cups, including two Conn Smythe Awards for most valuable player in the playoffs. Gretzky won the Ted Lindsay Award, the MVP of the league as voted by the players, five times. He is the all-time NHL points leader with 2,857 points. This is nearly a thousand more points than second place Yaramir Yager. He is the all-time goal scoring leader with 894 goals scored, 
He is the all-time assist leader with 1,963 assists. In fact, Gretzky has so many assists that if you took away those 894 goals, he would still be the all-time scoring leader for the NHL. That's the level of dominance we're talking about here. Wayne Gretzky holds or shares 61 different NHL records. He basically has the record for most records. And every team has player numbers they retired for their top players. After his retirement in 1999, which was a nice connection to the number 99 Gretzky famously wore, the number 99 was retired for the entire National Hockey League. No player ever again can wear the number 99 in the NHL. But his legacy for all of hockey goes even deeper than that. No one in minor leagues, the Canadian Hockey League, or colleges wears number 99 out of respect to the great one, Wayne Gretzky. This may be hard to properly relay, but here in Canada, there is an unwritten rule that you just don't wear number 99 at any level. Whether it be in minor hockey, high school, rec leagues, pickup, or beer league hockey, you just don't do it. And it's been that way for years. And in pickup or beer league hockey, if a player did for some reason wear 99 for a game, which sometimes happens, they would be endlessly chirped. Chirped is Canadian for trash talk, the likes you have never heard before. Chirped is relentless trash talk that gets much more personal. I may or may not have been on the delivery end of some of that chirping. This is the type of reverence for Gretzky I'm talking about, and you can see how much he meant to the city of Edmonton, Alberta, and to all of Canada. Wayne Gretzky was, is, and will always be my hero, and people all across the country have felt the same way, especially in Edmonton in the 1980s. Gretzky was even the face of a serial. Introducing a new star, Pro Stars. My mother taught me that a good nutritious breakfast is important. That's why new Pro Star cereal is part of my breakfast now. First, an ounce of Pro Stars with four ounces of milk is a good source of protein. Second, Pro Stars have a great toasted oat taste, lightly sweetened without added sugar. See, no sugar added. That's good. And mom likes my picture too. New Pro Stars, a touch of sweetness without added sugar. With all those records and championships he won for the Edmonton Oilers, the good times would surely last for years, wouldn't they? After winning the Stanley Cup in the 1987-88 season, along with playoff MVP, the good times seemed like they would just never end. Gretzky and the Oilers were on top of the hockey world, and there had never been a player in the NHL, and possibly in any sport ever, more valuable to their team. This was all going to shockingly change. As we saw Gretzky lift the Stanley Cup on May 26, 1988, little did we know this was the last time we would ever see him in an Oilers uniform. We enter the summer of 1988 with all things seemingly right in the world, especially if you were a Gretzky and Oilers fan. This summer also included what could be considered Canada's royal wedding when Gretzky married Janet Jones in a ceremony that captured the interest of a lot of the country. As we enter August and the lazy days of summer, we were all in for a rude awakening. Gretzky was at the top of his game, but not exactly being compensated that way. Behind the scenes, there were some troubles and some very slight rumblings of Gretzky being traded. But these weren't out in the open. Peter Pocklington, the then owner of the Oilers, appeared to be floating the idea out there. After all, Gretzky was more valuable than any other player in the history of the game. But who in their right mind would trade the greatest player the game would ever know? As usual, it's easy to forget that sports is a business, and the teams and players are assets. Pocklington, having brought the Oilers to Edmonton and landing Wayne Gretzky, was beloved for doing so. But that would all soon be forgotten. For Peter Pocklington, as successful as the Oilers were, he just didn't have the money to pay Gretzky what he was worth. The money that Gretzky probably should be making would have been more than the entire Oilers' payroll. But again, 
Even whispers of a trade could result in an unprecedented backlash by not only the people of Edmonton and Alberta, but for a lot of the country. Glenn Sather, the then president and general manager for the Oilers, told Pocklington, quote, you would go from being a hero in Canada to a schmuck, unquote. That was just for even considering it. Other people would end up using much more aggressive language to describe Pocklington. If Pocklington couldn't afford to pay Gretzky, he at least needed to get something for him, and that would mean a trade. But where do you even begin trading the greatest player in the world at the height of his ability, success, and popularity? Well, it turns out that the roots of this shocking trade actually went all the way back to 1985. Everything 80s will return after these messages. In the ESPN documentary, A King's Ransom, Pocklington tells of a meeting back in 1985 with Jerry Buss, the owner of the Los Angeles Lakers of the NBA. Buss had brought the Showtime brand of basketball to the NBA. Built off the back of Magic Johnson, the glitzy and glamorous on-court presentation helped to turn around the fortunes of a league that was struggling quite a bit in the early 80s. Buss was instrumental in making NBA games more than just the competition on the floor, but a full entertainment experience. Buss, at the time, also owned the Los Angeles Kings of the National Hockey League and offered Pocklington $15 million and some players for Gretzky. For Pocklington, this wasn't the time, but he said maybe they should talk later. Eventually, Buss sold the team to Bruce McNall, an entrepreneur and sports executive who owned racehorses and even produced some movies like War Games and Weekend at Bernie's. Buss mentioned to McNall that he had put the bug in Pocklington's ear about maybe buying Gretzky. Bruce McNall continued to push the issue. Eventually, Pocklington began to consider it. Gretzky was about to become an unrestricted free agent so Pocklington could end up with nothing. So it was either negotiate a contract Pocklington couldn't afford or trade the greatest player the game would ever know. The longer Pocklington held on to Gretzky, the less Gretzky would be worth because remember, quote, assets do depreciate. Getting $15 million and some new players could really help the Oilers going forward. Adjust this for inflation and convert it into Canadian currency and you're looking at the range of nearly $50 million. Quite a lot for a team that was technically in a small market. Hawkington was ready to talk. From there, things started to move pretty quickly, and rumblings of a trade began to murmur. Hawkington realized he was past the point of no return. In the ESPN documentary, Gretzky says how Pocklington let him in on the trade possibility and allowed him to eventually speak to Bruce McNall. At this point, Gretzky was living in LA with his soon-to-be wife. And here's the thing. If Gretzky was going to go to the LA Kings, they weren't exactly a good team. Gretzky would be leaving a powerhouse team, one of the best ever, that had Hall of Fame players like Mark Messier, Yari Curry, and Paul Coffey to go to a team that finished 20th out of 21 teams. Gretzky needed players to go with him. But, of course, all of this was behind closed doors. However, just a week after Gretzky was married in July, the rumors did start to fly. But that's all they must have been, right? Just rumors. This would be like trading Mickey Mantle in his prime or Michael Jordan after the 1991 Bulls bowl season. No one believed what they were hearing. But eventually, and we didn't know it yet, the deal was shockingly completed. Despite the rage and protest of Glenn Sather, who said, quote, he wouldn't trade Gretzky for an entire organization, Peter Pocklington had done the unthinkable. Wayne Gretzky would be traded to the Los Angeles Kings for Jimmy Carson, Martin Jelena, a first round draft pick in 1989, 1991. 1993, and $15 million. But Gretzky wouldn't be going alone. Also leaving Edmonton with him were Mike Krushelniski and enforcer Marty McSorley, who served like his protector on the ice. 
On August 9th, 1988, the news about the trade of the century was about to break to the world, along with an immense backlash that would quickly follow. When networks and news outlets picked up the story, my best friend immediately called me and I ran to his house watching the news in disbelief, as did many other people in Canada, as this dominated our TVs. For a lot of Canadians, it was a where were you when moment. The networks took us to a press conference to witness the unimaginable happening. But even in the minutes leading up to that press conference, Wayne was still given the opportunity to back out, but he didn't. As coverage of the press conference began, a visibly shaken Gretzky had trouble even getting through it. Eventually, he had to step away as he was too overcome with emotion. But eventually, we saw the surreal image of him putting on a black and white Kings jersey with the name Gretzky and number 99 on the back. It almost seemed alien. Wayne Gretzky was officially an L.A. King. Canada, the hockey world, and the sports world were in shock. This was the biggest trade the sports world had ever seen, and possibly would ever see. In Edmonton, the shock of the trade quickly gave way to rage. One member of parliament from Kamloops, B.C. even demanded that then-Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney step in and block the trade. People felt that Peter Pocklington had betrayed the city and destroyed the team. They were calling for his head and burning images of him. He received death threats, which forced his wife to leave town. Pocklington was now public enemy number one. And fans were just looking for anyone to blame. Even Gretzky's wife, Janet Jones, was unfairly blamed for making Gretzky go to L.A., and some started to perceive Gretzky as the traitor for leaving. Regardless of what the sentiment was, everyone had to face the fact the trade was done. This is August, and with the new season just a few months away, the dust needed to settle quickly. There was hockey to be played after all. Gretzky's first game for the Kings took place on October 6, 1988, and Oilers fans had to look on in disbelief as their hero was now with another team, and their city was changed forever. Appropriately, the number one song on Billboard this week was Love Bites by Def Leppard. But in Los Angeles, there was a massive buzz. Gretzky's first game was the equivalent of a Hollywood premiere. Every celebrity you could think of made it to the game, and the demand for tickets was through the roof, as they were for the entire season. Playing against the Detroit Red Wings, a team he grew up loving, Gretzky wasted no time in his first game and scored on his very first shot. He stepped up under the biggest spotlight in the biggest moment and didn't look back. As Michael Scott says, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Gretzky and the Kings trounced the Red Wings 8-2 with Gretzky adding three assists to his goal. Hockey had gone Hollywood. But for Gretzky, the inevitable had to happen. Just a few weeks later, Gretzky and the Kings were scheduled to meet the Oilers in Edmonton. I remember this game like it was yesterday, and the country was filled with anticipation. As Gretzky skated onto the ice at the old Northlands Coliseum, what would the response be? Would they boo him out of the building for abandoning the Oilers? Not at all. Gretzky skated out to a massive ovation. No matter what happened or how it had gone down, Wayne Gretzky would always be an oiler. In the coming years, we learned that there were other teams that Gretzky could have possibly been traded to. He could have been a Vancouver Canuck. On the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Gretzky explains how after winning the cup in 88, his dad told him there was interest in trading him. Gretzky got a call from someone we talked about earlier, Nelson Scalbania, who tried to get him to Vancouver. Gretzky has now told us that besides the Kings, the Philadelphia Flyers, New York Rangers, and Detroit Red Wings were all in the mix. Gretzky was leaning towards Detroit because his hero, the great Gordie Howe, played there. 
Gordy Howe is the reason Gretzky wore 99. Howe wore number 9, and this is the number Gretzky wanted when he got to junior hockey, but another player already had it. So Gretzky just doubled it up. It was Gretzky's dad that said that playing in Detroit would be like being in Gordy Howe's shadow, and it would be tough to create a new legacy from an already established hero. This is what helped convince him to go to LA. The trade of Wayne Gretzky meant that no athlete in any sport was above being traded. No matter how valuable and successful an athlete is, they're not above being moved around like an asset. The trade also showed the sporting world what a blockbuster deal could look like. At the time, it really was unprecedented. The trade for Wayne Gretzky really helped change the hockey landscape and led to the expansion of professional hockey on the West Coast and Southern United States. The success of the LA Kings and the huge draw that Gretzky was eventually led to teams in San Jose, the Anaheim Mighty Ducks, Arizona Coyotes, Colorado Avalanche, the Las Vegas Golden Knights, and now the Seattle Kraken. Eventually, new franchises emerged in other areas that hadn't been known as hockey markets like Florida with the Tampa Bay Lightning and Florida Panthers. There was a team in Atlanta and there's the Dallas Stars as well. Even if fans in these markets didn't necessarily know hockey, they knew Wayne Gretzky and his presence helped to grow and expand the game in the United States. More American kids than ever began playing hockey after seeing Gretzky in LA. And it's led to NHL players coming from states like California and Arizona, which were never known as hockey hotbeds. Gretzky never won another Stanley Cup, but he helped the Kings go deep in the playoffs, even reaching the finals in 1993, despite him high-sticking Doug Gilmore in the conference final against Toronto. Maple Leaf fans, that one's just for you. But the playoff successes of the Kings were a remarkable achievement, considering the difference in talent between them and who Gretzky had been playing with on the Oilers. Gretzky would continue to break records as a king before being traded for a short time to the St. Louis Blues and finishing up his career with the New York Rangers, one of the original teams he included on his first trade list. Gretzky played his final game on April 18th, 1999, and I'm fortunate to have an actual film print of him saying his on-ice goodbyes that night in Madison Square Gardens. So you can probably see how this is an important topic to me, as it was to millions of other Canadians at the time. For a kid like me, the trade really was emotional. I promise mess I wouldn't do this. But when the trade went down, it felt like having your heart broken. As I said, Gretzky was my hero. I put my skates on with the left one first because I read that's what Gretzky did. I still do that to this day, as I do with my shoes. I don't even think about it anymore. I just do it automatically. But it's because of him. A few years after the trade, I actually got the chance to see Gretzky play in person. I was fortunate enough to see the great one play in Detroit at the old Joe Louis Arena. It was Valentine's Day 1990, and I don't have to tell you that this is a defining core memory. LA ended up losing that game 6-5 to five thanks to a hat trick by the great Steve Eisenman, but Gretzky scored twice and had an assist. And if you're a Canadian of a certain age, Larry Robinson was actually playing in that game for the Kings in one of his last few seasons. And to tie this whole thing together with my very, very tiny but kind of bizarre connection to the Wayne Gretzky trade, I want to tell you a little story. Back in 2006, I lived and worked in London, England. I got a job at a pub in the west end of the city near the Pimlico region. Most nights at around 7 or 8 p.m., there was an older gentleman who looked like he was in his 80s that came in and always sat at the same table. He had a newspaper and a little notebook and just kept to himself. As I was just starting, the staff told me to just let him do his own thing. It wasn't that he was mean or anything, he just liked his privacy. And I'll never forget his drink order. A half glass of Chardonnay with two ice cubes. And he wanted the other half kept in the fridge to keep it chilled. We weren't supposed to do that, but made the exception. 
I would bring him his drink and maybe exchange the odd pleasantry, but that's as far as it went, as he rarely looked up or made eye contact. One day, maybe after about two or three months working there, and out of the blue, he says, Where are you from in Canada? That took me by surprise. Everywhere I've ever gone, especially in England, people always assumed I was American. He was one of only two or three people who knew I was Canadian. I explained how old I was and where I grew up in southwestern Ontario. Then he says, It must have been tough for you the day Gretzky was traded. Hold on, what? How in the world did he know about this? Yes, I said, but how do you know about that? He replied, I was there. Okay, time out. What in the hell is going on here? How exactly were you there, I asked. Well, I've done some work with Bruce McNall, he replied. How in the world would he know Bruce McNall? It turns out this older gentleman in the pub was one of the leading authorities on ancient Roman coins. I didn't know it at the time, but Bruce McNall had made most of his fortune buying and selling old coins. Since this man was an ancient coin expert, among others, McNall regularly met with him to consult on purchasing, selling, and appraising his collection through the 70s and 80s. And this older man from the pub happened to be in LA right when the trade was going down. I only stayed at that pub for a few more months before moving on to another opportunity, so I never saw this man again or even found out who he was. Was he just messing with me? If he was, he had certainly done his homework. But it was a bizarre and unique little connection to the event that had such a profound impact on me back in the summer of 1988. And on that bombshell, it's time to end. Thank you so much for listening. If you're listening to this episode the day it's released, longtime listeners will know where this is going. It's coming out exactly 35 years to the day of the Wayne Gretzky trade. I swear that these are never planned, but again, it just may be that these events I talk about and my specific release day contain some sort of cosmic significance almost as if it were the temporal junction point for the space-time continuum. On the other hand, it could just be an amazing coincidence. So if you like this show, be sure to check out my previous episodes for more great 1980s content. And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe to the Everything 80s podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss out on new episodes. If you're in a position to help support the show, you can consider becoming a part of Patreon.com. That's a platform to get access to bonus 1980s content like the Everything 80s Movie Review Podcast, where I review the good, the bad, and the ugly of 1980s movies. If you want to learn more, you can just head on over to Patreon.com slash 80s. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash 80S, or click on the link in the description. So I just want to thank you again for listening. Whether you're a first-time listener or you've been here from the start, I know there are so many podcasts out there. So the fact you're here with me listening to this one means the world to me. So that's it for me. I'm Jamie. This has been Everything 80s, but I'll be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it. <laughs>